Hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for coming out to our event uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have a very important topic that we're going to be discussing, so we're very glad to have you here with us. Uh, right off the bat, let me uh, clear up two items first. It was brought to my attention that the title of uh, this afternoon's discussion, Defending Our Transgender uh, Brothers and Sisters in Arms, might seem exclusionary to our friends in the non-binary community. Uh, that's not our intent. I just want to make sure that's clear. And we'll work to remedy that uh, for future events. Second, if you have not taken one of these flyers, which we have up there by the door, regarding the Tony Hunter and Bella Evangelista uh, Panic Defense Prohibition Act of 2019, please make sure and take one of these before you leave. This bill was just introduced in the D.C. City Council last week. Veterans Against Hate is very proud to support it. Uh, some of our folks here at the table are proud to support it as well. You'll hear more about that in a moment. But in order to follow our advocacy efforts and learn more about what you can do, please make sure and pick up one of these on your way out. Uh, I also want to thank GW Vets uh, for supporting this event and for all of the great work that they do. And a special thanks uh, to our speakers who you're going to meet in just a moment. Now, there are two things that I really want to emphasize uh, before we begin. Uh, first, this has become a personal issue to me as a result of my service uh, in the United States Army. I didn't have much interaction with the LGBTQ community before that, but the first unit I was in had several gay, lesbian, and transgender soldiers. So I can tell you from personal experience that there is no justification to the narrative that transgender soldiers are any less capable, patriotic, or dedicated to the mission than their peers. Uh, the second thing I want to mention is that this particular issue, the transgender military ban, should not be a partisan issue, it should not be a Democrat, Republican, pro-Trump, anti-Trump issue. This is simply bad policy. Any policy that, make, that makes life more difficult for 15,000 troops that are serving their country, that stepped up to risk their lives for their country, that's simply a bad policy. And let me mention one other reason why we don't want this to be partisan. Um, this is recent polling from the Public Religion Research Institute, which shows that support for transgender service members has increased among Republican voters. And this actually mirrors a Quinnipiac poll, which also shows that support going up by double digits from 2017 until 2019. So it's very important that we not exclude any groups, any voting blocks, because we think that they might not be receptive to this message. From what we can see, they are surprisingly receptive, although we still have a lot of work to do. I would also mention that this is not uh, an accident. This is the result of education and outreach, which has been conducted over the years by some of the organizations that we have represented here today. And so I personally uh, want to um, thank them for that. Now, we have Rodrigo uh, from the National Center for Transgender Equality on the way, caught in traffic. Uh, as soon as Rodrigo gets here, we're going to uh, have some opening remarks. But first, let's go ahead and, I guess, begin the discussion with our panel. Um, I'd like to give uh, everyone an opportunity to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about what your organization does, and uh, we'll start with you, Kara, if that's okay. Sure. Um, Kara Zajac. Uh, I served active duty Navy for seven years doing cybersecurity and also deploying on submarines. Um, currently, I'm a government contractor working for the Director of National Intelligence doing cyber coordination across the intelligence community and uh, attending GW, getting my degree full time. So <laughs> it's uh, good to be a student here and do a panel here. And then uh, finally, I'm uh, one of the members of Sparta. I handle uh, a lot of their website administration, user accounts, emails type setup. Blake? Hi, my name is Blake Dreeman. I'm an active duty Navy Lieutenant Commander uh, as a Supply Corps officer. Um, currently stationed here in uh, the DC area at Fort Beauvoir. I work at Defense Logistics Agency. Right now I'm the Chief of Readiness for the Nuclear Enterprise Support Office. Um, I handle all things readiness for all platforms uh, related to nuclear, both weapons and propulsion. Um, I've deployed I've been in the Navy uh, 13 years and deployed 11 times. Um, spent the first eight years of my career uh, at sea or over the seas or under sea. Uh, yeah, I did a lot. Uh, they, uh, they, they first stopped to put me on a, on a surface ship, then they sent me to Afghanistan, and then they uh, allowed me to be one of the first uh, female-bodied personnel 
to integrate submarines when the Navy integrated submarines in 2011. Um, most recently, I was the president of Sparta, um, recently turned that over in uh, beginning of July, uh, but still very active in the community. Um, and if you Google transmilitary or you talk about transmilitary, um, most of the, st the majority of the stories that you're going to read there are from service members that um, have come from Sparta and have been helped by our peer support and uh, their voices elevated to show that their contributions to the mission continue uh, in spite of everything that's going on. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Sasha Bookert and uh, I'm a, a veteran, I was a Marine Corps veteran. I served a long time ago, I'm old, um, <laughs> pre-transition. Um, and I'm also uh, an attorney at Lambda Legal and we work on um, LGBT issues and issues impacting people living with HIV uh, through po public policy advocacy, litigation, and public education. Thank you all so much for being here. And now we actually have uh, Rodrigo here from uh, National Center for Transgender uh, Equality. If you'd like to come up and say a few words before we begin. Hey everybody, can y'all hear me? I'm so short, I have to adjust microphones quite a lot. I'm still on my tiptoes half the time. All right, thank you everybody for being here today. I know it's a nice, beautiful, sunny Saturday afternoon and, and there's a lot of things you could be doing but you're here instead, so appreciate you coming out today. Uh, like Luke said, my name is Rodrigo hang I uh, use he, him pronouns, I'm an openly transgender man, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director at National Center for Transgender Equality. For those who don't already aren't already familiar with NCTE, we're a national organization, as you can tell from the name, <laughs> working to improve transgender people's lives around the country. We work to change policy and to increase understanding of our communities so that all transgender people and our families can be safe. This work has become even more urgent under the Trump administration, as, as all LGBT organizing has become. The discrimination administration has taken endless hostile actions against our community, from attacking transgender migrants, being held in detention facilities, to turning a transgender women away from homeless shelters, to refusing care to transgender patients when they are sick. The administration is trying to put up roadblocks at every single turn. And the same goes for the military dam, the reason that we are here today. There are over 15,000 transgender people currently serving in the military. 15,000. That, that usually surprises people because we're thought of as, as such a small community. They, we, uh, there are people doing, uh, who are combat effective and serving in every, represented in every single US combat zone today. And are doing every job out there in the military today. They've been already serving openly and honorably for close to two years without any problem. And, but Trump is trying to end all of that. This is nothing short of discrimination. When we hear a company, a private business, say that they are essentially categorically banning transgender people from even applying, we're outraged, and rightfully so. But here we have the federal government trying to, to do it already. This is the nation's largest example of employment discrimination. I'll let the expert panelists get more into the details, but it's worth noting that this current ban we're here for today is not the only trans military issue out there today. Even with an attempted ban on enrollment of new service members, there are still over 134,000 transgender veterans so that's 134,000 Americans who have already served or, or, and just happen to be trans. For them, support has improved at times, but there are still barriers to getting accurate medical records or ac any kind of accurate identification that reflects the gender that they live as every day. And that sounds like a bureaucratic detail, but it's critical for not outing you as transgender every single time you have to turn in some paperwork, <laughs> whether applying for a new job uh, or uh, updating other kinds of records or accessing medical services. 
and they still face barriers to VA coverage for all the necessary medical procedures. So keep in mind that we need to fight not just for the trans people wanting to enlist, but also for the trans people who have already served or are serving today. Now the question is what can we do to make this better? The panelists, I'm sure, have, have other ideas as well, but I can at least offer three things you can do. One is know your rights. If you, are, if you or someone you know is a transgender veteran, be aware that although it's not perfect, there is a vet, Veterans Health Administration policy that offers some degree of healthcare protections. And a lot of people don't already know this. It instructs all VHA staff to use your requested name, and your requested pronouns, even if your documents are not updated. So regardless of what your ID says, you have a right to be addressed by your preferred name and your preferred pronouns, no matter what, when working with the VA. And it also, it covers all transition-related healthcare except surgeries. So that's why it's not perfect, because surgeries are still not covered and we need to fix that. But it does cover hormone replacement therapy, uh, medically required prosthetics, a lot of other services that transgender people need are explicitly covered by this VHA policy. TRICARE also covers a similar set of services. Again, not surgery, but yes, hormones, yes, mental health care, yes, a lot of these other things that are critically important to getting the care that you need. And that goes for enrolled dependents as well. The second thing you can do is get ready to pressure HUD. Does, does anybody know what HUD stands for? It's kind of a nerdy thing. Yeah? Come on, shout out. Take a guess. Housing, housing, housing. Yes. Gold stars for all three of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people don't know that uh, Secretary Carson from Housing and Urban Development is going to release a policy soon that would allow federally funded homeless shelters to turn transgender people away. He claims that gender segregated facilities, like say a women's shelter, are unsafe when transgender people are allowed because it opens the door to abuse. But we know that that is not true. Our safety is important to all of us. And that's why harassment is already illegal. If anyone violates these, uh, but commits harassment in a shelter, they are kicked out, regardless of gender. And that's why the people who care most and know most about safety and homelessness support welcoming transgender people in homeless shelters. This includes experts like the YMCA and YWCA and sexual assault service organizations all around the country. All of us can agree that when people are desperate and vulnerable, when people have lost their home and have nowhere else to go, they deserve to be welcomed and treated with open arms. So we expect this dangerous policy to be proposed any day now. And when it happens, there will be a public comment period. So we need every single person in this room to get to submit your public comment when that drops and to get all of your friends to do so as well. The third thing you could do is to join the Trans March. Has anyone heard of the Trans March before? Yes, okay, great, a few folks. That is uh, the very first Trans March on Washington, the Transgender March of Vis Transgender Visibility March. It's next Saturday. It's exactly one week from today. We will rally at Freedom Plaza near the White House mm -hmm. and then march over to the Capitol. So I really encourage everyone here to come out to the Trans Visibility March, whether you are trans or an ally, all are welcome at the march next Saturday. So the world may feel grim right now with the discrimination administration in the White House, but there is always something we can do to make it better. Know your rights, participate in the HUD comment period, and come out to the March next Saturday. Thank you all for coming here today on the Sunday afternoon, and I'll turn it over to the panelists. Thank you very much, Thank you. Sorry we started with that, so we left someone behind and not supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and get started on this uh, topic. I was hoping, um, Sasha, if you could maybe start off by telling us what is the transgender military ban? How does it work legally? What exactly are we talking about? And also, I'm sorry, you can turn on your microphone with a little switch there on the top. Yeah, can people hear me? Feel, I don't like microphones, okay, to that's be honest fine. with you. Do you outside, need it for please. the video? Being okay, how about now? Better? Okay. Um, and maybe I'll just, maybe Blake and I. We'll share it, yeah. <laughs> um, I think, well, 
before I launch in, just I just wanted to touch on the, just because I'm going to forget, on the ordinance that um, uh, Luke mentioned earlier that was recently introduced in the DC City Council. Um, if, if folks have a minute, if you could just, if you, if you support the legislation, it would be awesome if you could contact your city council member and ask them to vote in support of it. It's a bill that would prevent defendants from arguing that, you know, um, a defendant's gender identity or sexual orientation what was what drove them to commit violence and get a leaner, leaner sentence than other they would otherwise get. In other words, instead of getting first degree murder, they would, they would, if they argued that, well, I didn't know she was trans, and so that justifies my violence, so I should get you know a ten year sentence. Um, that's that's what the bill would do. Is it would prevent that kind of a defense from from happening. It's it's for gender identity, but also for sexual orientation and race and national origin and all the other protected characteristics under DC law. Uh, but to answer the question, sorry, Luke. Um, so the, the the question about what the policy is today, um, we'll get to that. But I think it's important to do a little bit of a look back and just kind of you know kind of go through for folks that might not be as familiar, you know, with you know the what's happened and what's what's brought us here to where we are today. So I think it's helpful to kind of to do that a little bit. I won't go deep deep into the weeds with the different policies, but I think it's important to just uh, uh, get get a little perspective. Um, so in, in June of 2016, uh, then Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter, under the Obama administration, um, it, it's created an inclusive policy that said that trans folks can serve openly for who they are. They can't be drummed out of the military. Uh, and they um, asked the Department of Defense to create some guidelines for in-service transition for people that wanted to change genders while they're serving. Uh, and then it also created some criteria for people that wanted to uh, join the military. And we call it a, a session. See if you see that word, a session, that's what we're talking about. It's for people that want to join or people that are trying to become an officer. You know, uh, it's, it's um, uh, a policy that requires people to be stable in their gender if they've undergone some kind of hormone treatment uh, or surgical care for 18 months. So it's just what the policy was under the Carter administration and what it is today uh, in, in uh, um, a small way that I'll talk about in a second. But it's, that's, so that was, that was the policy. They, they said they wanted to wait a year to implement it. So they were, it was scheduled to go into effect on July 1st of 2017. Uh, and um, of course, 2016 happened and you know the Trump administration came in and you know we knew there would be trouble we actually frankly thought it would come from the House of Representatives which it did but uh, uh, we didn't expect it to be on, on this scope uh, of um, a trouble and so in late June uh, there were warning signs because Secretary Mattis said well you know we've got this a sessions policy that's set to go take place on July 1st of 2017 but we're not ready to do that so we're going to push it out another six months so they asked for it to go into effect on the first of January of 2018. And, um, and then, of course, a few weeks later, uh, the president issued his infamous tweets saying that he checked in with his generals and uh, said that trans people specifically wouldn't be able to serve. And um, uh, followed, up, followed that up with an advanced directive in August of 2017, ordering the Secretary of Defense to move forward with um, uh, that directive. And uh, uh, Secretary Mattis put together um, a panel of experts in the Department of Defense. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So this group of folks, um, uh, we met for three months and even forgot to mention, you know, lead in leading up to the uh, Carter policy, there were, you know, literally conversations with thousands of people about how to do this right. They looked at, they commissioned a, a nonpartisan study from the RAND Corporation. If you know anything about the RAND Corporation, they're not, they're not some left-wing activist group, you know, they're as boring as it get. And they looked at the 18 countries, you know, that uh, uh, allow open service, in, including Israel, Great Britain, New Zealand, um, Australia, you know, all those, you know, um, uh, they looked at the policies there and said that, you know, that, you know, uh, there is no reason to not move forward with this policy was the end, end conclusion. But contrast that with the, the Mattis, you know, uh, panel of experts that met uh, 13 times in three months and they met with military and civilian uh, experts and um, at the end of that period in December uh, they made uh, recommendations which we've never seen you know what we have seen there is absolutely zero reason to believe that the panel of experts concluded that there was you know some serious issue with open transgender military service there's no evidence of that you know there's people that you know had you know, concerns, but overall, from the documents we have been able to look at, you know, um, 
Uh, it's been a, they, were, they were favorable, you know, there was nothing but favorable input. There was mostly favorable input. Uh, and then uh, Secretary Mattis issued uh, a recommendation a report in um, February of 2018. And uh, this is just makes me angry just talking about it because it's so offensive. But, you know, they, in the report, if you read it, it's a 44-page uh, uh, document that, you know, says that they, you know, looked at the information from the panel of experts, but then talked to other, you know, unnamed sources for input on what the policy should be. And, uh, you know, really put together some, you know, absolute, in my opinion, bunk uh, uh, evidence into this report that argues that transgender people should be uh, denied the ability to serve, you know, openly. And I think the most important one for me is, this leads into a question later, is the issue around medical care. Because that's you know you know uh, uh, the the arguments that were raised in that um, report had been repeated in the civilian sector quite a bit as well. But um, the, the the they're just absolutely there's just a every reputable medical organization that has looked at the question of whether clinically or whether uh, transitional healthcare treatment is clinically effective for transgender people has has unanimously. Um, uh, uh, issued position statements saying that it is. And that includes the preeminent healthcare organization in the country, the American Medical Association, who issued not one, not two, but three different statements as this litigation has proceeded telling the Trump administration that there is absolutely zero medical basis for you, for you to deny transgender people and uh, the ability to serve openly. The American Psychological Association, the American uh, 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 Psychiatric Association have all issued multiple statements. You know, so contrasted with you know, that vast body of uh, medical, peer-reviewed medical evidence, uh, the stuff that was put into this recommendation report were things like, well, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of mental health care encounters that we've seen, you know, with with uh, trans folks serving in the military. So that you know clearly demonstrates that this is an unstable population. Uh, but what they don't tell you, because it's all sleight of hand, is that as part of your transition plan as a as a transgender person, you know how the military is. You know, it's very structured, and you have like you know um, uh, every every person that goes through a transition and like and other folks can speak more fluently to this has to go to medical medical healthcare therapy. They don't have a, they don't have an option, even if they don't want to. I think everybody should. I don't think it ever should be used against you and argue that you shouldn't be able to be who you are. But you know they don't they don't tell you that part of it that you have to go weekly to go see a therapist. You know they just say oh there's all these this increase in medical health care, uh, mental health care providers. Um, and then another example I mean there's like so many I can go through them all. But another example that just makes me crazy is there's a they cite this study from the the finding from the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. You know that that wouldn't issue a national coverage determination saying that Medicare recipients, if people are, I don't, this is still confusing to me, but Medicare and Medicaid, the difference is Medicare is for people who are 65 years and older or who have a qualifying condition, and, and Medicaid is for folks who are, you know, struggling and they're low income, so that, that need, you know, a, a boost. So that's, those are, if you're not, it's taken me a while to figure out that difference. I just want to put that out there. But, but, but they, did a, they did a study for the Medicare population, you know, with, as a result of some um, uh, advocacy from folks that you know wanted them to issue a national coverage of determination, saying that you know you can't you, that this this care should be provided on an ongoing basis as a as a to anyone who needs it who uh, as a medically necessary treatment, and they didn't they didn't issue it they didn't issue the national coverage determination because they didn't have enough evidence for. Uh, people who are 65 years and older who are seeking sex reassignment surgery. Can you imagine how small that population is? But they but they passed it off as some you know some gigantic you know smoking gun finding that this is clearly not clinically effective. And they didn't mention that the very they had the, the Medicare had a, an exclusion in t up to 2014 saying they wouldn't cover surgical care for transgender people at all. And it was challenged by a group of advocates that said, "That's you can't have this categorical exclusion." And we won in 2014. So they don't have a they, re, they removed the national coverage determination denying people the care. They just wouldn't issue a positive one saying that it has to be required. So they use that to say, "Oh, this is clearly you know a, a, a reason that people shouldn't be able to serve openly." Anyway, um, uh, just huge issues with the with the findings and the recommendation report. So um, uh, that was uh, the policy that they came up with in that um, recommendation report, which has been uh, mostly adopted in the final version uh, that took, took, took effect on April 12th of this year, 
um, and we'll talk about the you know why that happened and about the preliminary injunctions later. But um, the final policy to answer the question finally here is that you know they they created a policy that said that. If you're you're grandfathered in, if you're a trans, and they, they're not doing this for their love of trans folks, and you know, in my view, they're doing it because they're worried about the the litigation and the reliance issues at stake. Uh, but there, but the policy is that if you if you um, had if you've had a gender d d dysphoria diagnosis before April 12th, you can continue to serve, you know, as who you are, and you can continue to access medical care. If you have not had a gender dysphoria diagnosis before gen April 12th, and you're currently serving. Uh, you can't transition. You're prohibited from transitioning. And if you're seeking to enlist in the military, uh, they do something that is absolutely heinous, in my in my opinion. They, you know, they say that you know, uh, uh, you, if you have any kind of history of uh, uh, medical care or transition-related healthcare treatment or um, anything uh, uh, related to, to to being trans, basically, that you have to show evidence that you can um, serve that 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 you're 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 stable in your birth sex for 36 months before you're able to serve. So you have to get a doctor to send a, sign a letter saying that you're stable in who you are not, you know, which, is, which absolutely flies in the face of all medical evidence about treating gender dysphoria and being transgender. It's absolutely, uh, uh, you know, and it, it, you know, I have no evidence. We'll, we are working on that and we'll get to that later. But you know, it's clear to me that the, the, this, this policy came out of some of the folks that really want transgender people to be erased. <laughs> they, want, they want to support things like conversion therapy and, and, and other issues, but it's, it's a clear uh, consequence of what we believe are advocates you know, that have influenced this decision-making process beyond the panel of experts. So. And I want to jump onto that point very quickly. So um, as most of us know, uh, President Trump, uh, Trump announced this um, policy by a tweet saying basically that he consulted with his generals and it was their decision that, that this was going to be the policy going forward. If that were the case, uh, the Pentagon and the generals and, and these other folks would have been able to move very quickly on this policy. If this was such a troublesome group, you think they would have plans in place ready to go. Instead, the exact opposite seemed to happen. The military really dragged their feet on this as long as they could. Mattis dragged his feet on this as long as they could. Because these were 15,000 service members that they were talking about. And they did not want to lose them. They did not want to make life more difficult for them. So I think, uh, to highlight the point that you ended with, it does not seem like this policy really came uh, from them and from, from their opinion. Um, now, Kara, I know that uh, you served as an enlisted uh, sailor until shortly after the repeal of the ban under the previous administration. Could you tell us a little bit about what life in the military was like before and after the ban was repealed? Sure. Um, so I started serving in 2010. Uh, actually, I got the tail end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, so that was a little odd, and then that was great. Um, so. You know, I was this person discovering who I was. Um, you know, I was, I realized I was trans and uh, that just kind of spiraled into a downward depression. Uh, it wasn't very fun. I actually uh, reached out to a therapist and uh, got on HRT uh, illegally without the Navy knowing. And then, uh, you know, karma or good luck or bad luck coming one day later, they were like, oh, hey, we're gonna start a 180 day working group to uh, determine if trans people can serve or not. And what was really great about that policy was it elevated uh, if how you get kicked out of the military. So me being illegally on HRT would have been something that would have been like, if it was found out that I was trans, they would just be like, oh, we can admin separate you from the military um, because I did it, you know, not going through the military because if I said I was trans before that, I would be kicked out. Um, under that policy, it elevated it to uh, I don't know, it was like an admiral level or something? Uh, OSD. Uh, OSD, so it was like really high, so your like CO couldn't just, your commanding officer couldn't just be like, I don't like you, get out of the military. Um, so that gave me at least some breathing room um, while that policy was, uh, that working group was going on to come out to my command. Um, I, it was the Office of Naval Intelligence right here in Siouxland. I was a cybersecurity analyst. Um, really good, got plenty of awards. Um, I can tell you that uh, when I started my transition there, um, nothing really changed. Um, nobody really cared, right? Um, in the military, uh, you hear it a lot, like, I don't care who you are as long as you can do the job. And a lot of my coworkers uh, took that to heart, right? So um, I would say nothing really bad happened. In fact, it, it was better. I got to be who I was. 
Um, I already th was a hard worker and somehow I became an even harder worker, which I didn't think was possible. Um, you know, uh, I authored a lot of intelligence reports, had a small team underneath me. Um, there really only bad parts from that were um, a lot of times because there was no policy out at that exact moment, um, a lot of people didn't know exactly what to do. Uh, I'm lucky that uh, I had, you know, people above me that were like, well, it's medical, you do you, and, you know, it's, you know, you take care of yourself so you can take care of the mission. So um, I luckily met with uh, one of my bosses that put me in touch with Sparta, which me and Blake mentioned earlier, but we didn't talk about. Um, Sparta is an active duty trans military organization. Um, they also have veterans and other things, but it's uh, specifically for uh, supporting trans uh, sailors, Marines, Air Force um, people. We're at a thousand members, I want to say, most of which close. are close, yeah. yeah, close of which are active duty. Um, so I met them, which was great. I got in touch. I actually got to go to Navy Medical and put all my, you know, diagnosis and stuff in the military medical records. So I was no longer in a threat of being kicked out. And honestly, uh, until that, um, it, it basically continued business as usual. I did have a couple hiccups where, you know, people weren't sure, uh, you know, like my CEO and was like, I don't want to, you know, they err on the side of caution where they're like, well, I don't know if you can do this. So I'm going to err that you're not going to be able to do this, which uh, definitely was some hangups, but nothing. Uh, I've never, I didn't have anything bad happen to me at all. Um, coworkers were great. What's up? Your name change. Oh, what about <laughs> it? That was, that was pretty bad. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, I didn't get my gender marker changed while I was in the military. I got my name changed, um, which you would think would be a really simple process. All you have to do in the military is, you know, get a court order or some legal document of your name change, whether that's a marriage certificate or whatnot, and then send that to military personnel. And uh, they didn't, <laughs> uh, they just entered in the system and then eventually you can check and you're like, oh, hey, my name got updated and you can, you know, change your name and all your other stuff in the military. Um, well, first what happened was my CEO thought it was a trans issue uh, and, you know, trans stuff was going on right now. So he wanted to send that to the undersecretary of Navy, <laughs> undersecretary of the Navy, which is really high up there. So it uh, routed up there and got lost, as we like to say. So I had to resubmit it a couple months later. Um, then that one made it to military personnel command. I did have some weirdness. So uh, my command, well, at least my division was pretty pretty good but you know we had this thing where so when people got ma uh, married they would change their name on their desk to their you know their married name while the paperwork was going through technically that's not how that's supposed to work you're supposed to wait but they were like yeah it's gonna go through anyways right and so I tried to do that and they definitely made me wait and I you know raised hell about it and you know my chiefs eventually apologized to me and said you're right we were wrong in doing it before but uh, you can't have it until your name gets officially changed. And I was like, oh, okay, I see how it is. Um, definitely, uh, definitely some hangups like that. Um, but for the most part, that was just, you know, a lot of that is leadership, not knowing what it is. If it was my uh, fellow enlisted sailors or my uh, team officer that was in charge of us, like greatest people ever, and, and we didn't have any problems going forward or anything like that. Blake, you're currently a commissioned officer responsible for soldiers under your command. How is the current uh, implementation of the ban affecting uh, transgender soldiers? Um, so you have you have a couple of things going on um, right now. Actually, to this date, we we have um, maybe four or five service members throughout the military that are in the process of being discharged. Um, for being trans, however, um, for every single one of them, it is their choice. Um, they went to their commands knowing they needed to transition and decided that they needed to move forward. Problem is, is that you also, you have to go through medical board, then you gotta go through performance board, and then you gotta go through all the paperwork. So it actually takes a little while for that to happen because that this is a medical issue. Um, but generally, those that want to stay, they have an extra added level of stress. Um, because now what you have is a two-tier system. You have those, now you have two different service members, one that's grandfathered and one that's not. One that's treated as though uh, they are able to contribute to the mission and one that's treated as though they contribute to the mission but they can't do what they need to do medically. 
So you have, um, with all this emphasis, this this is one of my this is one of my biggest problems with this whole policy, is we have a renewed int well not a renewed but a continued interest in mental health in the military, and here we have a specific treatable mental health issue in the military that if you go and say I need this treatment, even though it doesn't affect the mission any more than any other medical issue and is entirely treatable will get you kicked out of the military. And it is proven that not treating this particular issue will lead to negative mental health outcomes. So don't tell me that you care about veteran and service member suicides, but we identify specific issues that say, I'm going to kick you out if you come to me and say you need help with this particular issue because the number one thing that will help veterans and active duty service members in preventing suicide is the ability to continue to do their job. Uh, the moment you make take those things away, then that, that the chances of suicide or suicide attempts rises significantly. So th those are the things that we deal with on a regular basis um, with our members is just the, I don't know if they, they go back and forth between, I don't know if I can do this to, I want to be able to do this to, uh, I have to be the example because I'm one of the grandfathered ones to, oh, I really want to slink back and just go back to doing my job. It's, it's a constant battle. Now, Sasha, I know that there are a number of court challenges that are still kind of making their way through the legal system. For those of us that are not, uh, you know, familiar with these cases, where are they right now? What's the basis for these challenges, and where do you see them going in the next few months? Can I? Um, I'll respond to that. But can I <laughs> talk about three quick things that I forgot sure. to talk about that really that drive me crazy too? Uh, one is this issue around unit cohesion, which is you know often cited. I think it was cited in Trump's tweets. You know, and I just want to flag that, you know, not only has, you know, the Department of Defense not produced any evidence to us in litigation argue, from showing that there has been disturbances to unit cohesion, but the all four unit service, all four military service chiefs under oath in a Senate uh, Armed Services Committee testified that there haven't been disruptions to unit cohesion. So I just want to flag that as something that, you know, to, to deal with that issue straight on. And then uh, I also want to address the issue of cost, because I feel like that underlies some of this conversation to some degree. And uh, you know, the costs that have been you know, uh, estimated by the military have been grossly inflated. You know, uh, the RAND Corporation predicted that it would cost roughly 2.4 to 8 point, or 2.2 to 8.4 million dollars a year. And you know, in our case, we had a former Secretary of the Navy, Roy Mavis, who, who um, submitted a declaration saying that he called that budget dust in contrast to the entire defense military budget because it's less than one tenth of one percent of the entire healthcare budget. Uh, and it turned out it was less. Yeah, <laughs> right. it was less than that. So Rand actually inflated it as well. Yeah. It turned out, even with all the stuff that they tried to say, all the people came out. It came out less than that per year in the three years that we were able to serve openly. Which isn't unique to either the US, to the other military contexts where people are serving openly, including Israel, or you know, uh, Australia, et cetera. You know, they have had the same conclusions, but it's also the same with the civilian sector. There's been study after study that have shown that there's no increase in the, 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 the budgets of, to provide health care for trans people in their budgets. It's, less, it's, it's consistently been less than one-tenth of one percent. And the last issue I just wanted to mention is this issue around deployability, because that's you know something that's raised consistently. You know, because they you know, the military adopted this deployer get out policy uh, a year and a half or two ago, ago that says that if you can't um, if you can't if you're non deployable for more than a year, then you, you can't serve. And, and uh, it was just a really about. Uh, uh, was it earlier this year? We the first ever open, uh, uh, the first ever panel in front of the House Armed Services Committee 
uh, and I, you know, I got to go and watch Blake and, and uh, some of his colleagues that you know talked about this issue about deployability. And you know, the one of the Republicans on the committee was asking them, you know, well, what do you think about you know, you know, the these kinds of standards, you know, that you know the, the military has adopted that are you know neutral. And uh, it just made me really proud, you know, to be a transgender but be a veteran to hear you know their responses to a person. You know, they consistently across the board said, look. You know, if a person, transgender or not, can't meet those standards, they shouldn't be able to serve. You know, uh, and everyone has met those standards. You know, um, most of our plaintiffs have been consistently deployed. We can't we can barely get a hold of one because she's in South Korea all the time. So, you know, this idea that somehow trans people can't, are non-employable is absolute bunk. So I just wanted to... So, <laughs> so their own study on deployability... So the, the standard is that you, that you are no longer eligible for the military if you can't deploy for a consecutive 365 days. That's, that's the policy. 12 months or get out, right? The military's own study found that for the Air Force, the average non-deployability time was 192 days. For the Army, it was 186 days. And for the Navy, it was even less because we don't put people on LIMDU while they go through transition um, unless they're in a specific type of billet that requires them to come off the sh Like they're submarines or spec war and they have to deploy all the time, right? Um, and even then, they're not being 12 months non-deployable. So this whole idea that 12 months is unachievable by transgender service members is debunked by their own study by how long people were non-deployable by. So we welcomed the study because we said, hey, let's let's go. Let you know, we're telling you right now that trans people can deploy, they can deploy, they can deploy. And now they and they and they consistently are trying to restrict our ability to deploy. Um, even to the point of, okay, well, no injectables. Okay, well, we switch over to other things. So there are other ways to take hormones, right? We don't necessarily need to do those injectables. Or they say, well, you got to get your gender marker changed. Well, the Air Force has an exception to policy pro uh, thing that we can rush through if we need to. Same with the, with the uh, Marine Corps. They can do exceptions to policy. The Navy and the Army don't care how long it takes as long as you're stable on hormones. So as long as you're stable on hormones, they'll change your gender marker. So it... The, the more restrictions that they, they threw at us, the more we would find ways to make sure that our service members um, met those standards and continue to be able to deploy. There's, that's, that is why Sparta exists, is to make sure that our service members have the support and the necessary information that they need to make sure that they are completely and utterly able to contribute to the mission in which they volunteered for. Now, on that note, I was saving this slide until later because I think it's such a remarkable fact. This is from Military Times. The military spends more on uh, ED medicine yeah. than it does on um, transgender health care. So it's clearly not bankrupting uh, the military. And this is from the Military Times. Yep, that's, that's totally true. And I don't want to think anyone, I don't want anyone to think that I don't want you to get your ED meds. Right. <laughs> um, but we have to make sure that we take it into context that military spends a lot of money on a lot of things. Transgender health care is not taking away from readiness of the force. It's, it's just not. My hormones cost $90 every three months. So, and that is, the, and I have missed a total of six weeks of work over the course of two and a half years. And I was on like small limited duty for about two and a half weeks after my top surgery. That's it. Nothing else. And the majority of our service members are exactly the same way. So, um, and those that aren't, hey, we'll either help them work to get into their 12-month period, or we will help them figure out what they're going to do after they get out. Sasha, we're going to get back to the court challenges. I'm really curious <laughs> Sorry. about... No, 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 I'm glad that we covered all this ground, but um, it's very important, I think, that folks that want to be advocates have a better understanding of where we are in the legal challenge. Yeah, this is a little boring, sorry. Um, uh, so there's four different cases that are moving through the courts right now that challenging the, the ban. Uh, one is a case that Lambda Legal, along with our partners, the Modern Military Association of America, uh, have brought in the Western District of Washington challenging the ban. And there's also a case that the ACLU has brought in the uh, District of Maryland that's called Stone v. Trump. And then there's a case in the D.C. 
uh, district court that the National Center for Lesbian Rights and the LGBTQ um, defenders have brought that um, uh, together, uh, as well as a case that both of those organizations have brought in the, uh, the district of Central District of California. And um, uh, all of those cases, including ours, uh, have you know um, seen really uh, good, strong decisions at the district court. You know, we all uh, obtained nationwide preliminary injunctions, you know, uh, prohibiting the ban from going into effect uh, that were in place, you know, from roughly the end of 2017 all the way through, uh, all the way through 2018. So, you know, that, you know, protected transgender service members for a very long time. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, the Supreme Court stepped in. You know, the Department of Justice, by the way, has been, you know, extremely aggressive, you know, with this policy. I mean, they, you know, are, have put so many resources into fighting this fight. It's just unfathomable to me how important it is that trans people don't serve openly in the military to them. For instance, you know, um, they've done, they, they did this in one other, one other case, but it's, it's extremely rare. You know, it, if folks are familiar with the, the way the courts work, is that if you, you know, uh, don't get the judgment that you wanted on the district court level, you go to the appeals court. And then if you don't get the decision you wanted there, then you might ask the Supreme Court to step in. But the Department of Justice has been so aggressive about this issue that they actually tried to leapfrog the circuit courts. They just went straight to the Supreme Court. Maybe it's, you know, they felt like they had the right guy in the court, you know, to, <laughs> after Kavanaugh was confirmed to, to move it forward. But uh, it's just really exceptional and just shows you how much, um, how much they've invested into this policy issue. And I was talking to somebody earlier, you know, it, it consistently surprises me, um, and this is just a deeper question, about how much attention our community gets. We're not a large community, we're probably 0.7% of the population, but the attention that transgender people get, as, as, as Rodrigo mentioned earlier, from this administration is unbelievable to me. You know, whether it's Ben Carson making comments, you know, to his staff, whether it's, you know, Roger Severino trying to carve out people from HHS, whether it's the Trump administration. And, you know, maybe this is something deeper. Maybe there, there's a, maybe they feel threatened. I don't know. But it's just, you know, really uh, uh, been hard on our community, you know, and, uh, you know, we're a marginalized <laughs> community to begin with. And, and uh, sometimes it, it, it really worries me and it, it hurts me, you know, to think about, you know, people that aren't as um, in positions as, where there is, you know, have as much support as I do, for example, you know, people that live in rural areas that see these news uh, reports day after day after day. So uh, I just, just saying this, it's been a really, really difficult time for our community is all I'm saying. Um, going back to the cases, uh, so every court that's looked at the issue on the district court level, you know, <laughs> felt without a doubt that this was, you know, clearly a discriminatory policy that violates the Constitution and, and said that, you know, that they enjoin the, the uh, ban from moving forward. As I said, they leapfrogged over the circuit courts and went straight to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme, they asked the Supreme Court to take up the case. The Supreme Court didn't, but they stayed the preliminary injunctions meaning that they allowed them to, to go into effect, you know. So those, all, the, all four of those preliminary injunctions as a result of the Supreme Court stay um, uh, dissolved because of that. So now where we are is that we are going back to the district court to move towards trial, which means that we're doing a lot of discovery. We're getting a lot of documents. And we're seeing some really interesting documents. For example, we recently learned that the Department of Defense was talking to this person named Paul McHugh, who is no friend to the trans community. You know, that um, uh, it's demonstrated animus for, through his entire career. He shut down the Johns Hopkins program uh, that provided surgical care for trans people up to like 1980 something. And they did that after the panel of experts study was done. You know, showing that they were fishing, looking for something to support that the 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 lack of justification that came out of the panel of experts. So that's what we're doing now. We're preparing, you know, to move towards trial, going through a lot of discovery, trying to un unpack what we believe are, you know, the 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 you know zero grounds for Trump talking to his chiefs, you know, but but also pointing out that this whole this whole process is basically a sham. 
I want to ask um, Kara and Blake about some of the misinformation that we were talking about just a moment ago. Because for folks that want to be advocates on behalf of transgender service members, one of the best things you can do is just know how to respond to some of these um, statements when they come up. We talked a moment ago about medical expenses being too much for transgender service members and how that's clearly inaccurate. Uh, two other things uh, for both of you I'd like uh, to get your opinions on this. Number one uh, is the idea that transgender service members reduce morale or it's difficult to have them in a platoon or whatever the case may be. And the second thing, getting back to the question of deployability, uh, we have service members that deploy using all types of medications for various conditions. Is there anything uh, that transgender service members uh, need in terms of medication that makes them different, makes them less deployable, or, or anything along those lines? Kara uh, or Blake? Blake, you want to start with the deployability one? Sure. So I'll start with deployability. It's my favorite subject. <laughs> so, um, so let's let's start one thing. One in six American service members deploy regularly on some sort of anti-anxiety medication without any issue or requirement for a waiver. One in six. Um, sometimes one in five, depending on uh, the particular year. But the last, the last uh, study I saw was one in six. Um, they don't even require a waiver or require access to mental health services on a regular basis. Um, trans people take hormones. Guess what hormones do and don't do? One, they make my life better. And they make me and they make me happier, um, but my lack of hormones won't kill me. Uh, if someone were not to take their blood pressure medication, also deployable without a waiver, uh, they could keel over. If you take um, pill version of insulin, entirely deployable, including on a submarine, no restrictions. It does require a waiver, but hey, if my XO my executive officer can deploy on uh, insulin, that pill insulin, non-injectable, and there's nobody has a problem with that, then there's no problem with someone taking, like, say, gel hormones or, in the, in, or pill hormones, right? It shouldn't be an issue. Um, we deploy service members all the time on all kinds of things without any issues whatsoever. You are not hearing about service members dying in non-combat incidents because they didn't take their medication or they couldn't get it. So all this, all this uh, idea that, oh my God, I can't get my medication, it's never happened. You might go a couple of weeks, but the guy that walks out there with his blood pressure medication is not having any trouble getting it. And the person that deploys on their hormone medication, which we've had on several, is not having any trouble getting their deployment medication, including this guy right here in the front row who just got back from Afghanistan about two months ago. Okay? <laughs> Same... <laughs> So it's one of those things that anybody tells you that, oh, you can't deploy on medication, they're full of it, and they've never deployed in their life. So I'd call out anybody that says you can't deploy on medications because I don't think they've ever deployed. Um, second, mental health, for crying out loud. We all have issues that we all need to deal with. Nobody, nobody is going over there unstable, um, and those that are aren't trans. So um, the biggest thing that I, I've seen, I saw somebody denied a deployment not because um, they were having issues, but the potential of an issue because the psychologist that was in um, UAE, which is like a sort of deployment because you can go out in town and stuff, so I don't really call it a deployment to the Middle East. Um, the psychologist there was afraid that if the person did have an issue with their gender dysphoria, which wasn't an issue because they'd already transitioned, uh, they wouldn't know what to do. So um, they were actually denied the waiver to deploy for that. And you're like sitting there going, well, how am I supposed to deploy if we're not training our psychologists, right? Um, so any, any thought with regards to deployability is nothing that we haven't dealt with, and everybody, I, so for lack of better words, um, when the word transgender comes up when you talk about medication, deployability, medical care, for the majority, even medical population, the IQ of that person suddenly uh, freezes, 
and they suddenly think that you're talking about something that is way outside their um, their field of expertise when it is really not that difficult and that if they were to read on things or in general uh, just talk to the person and what they need then it's not an issue and that that is the that is with deployability what was the other question it was morale, morale and I can handle you can, some you of can, that. You yeah. can talk to morale, too. <laughs> yeah, um, which uh, Blake kind of brought up uh, little tidbits of it, and that's there's uh, so much misinformation out there. And, you know, as Blake said, people seem to just randomly drop an IQ, you know. Uh, there's, you know, people asking about, well, well, they're deployed. Where are they going to use the bathroom? And you're like, the tree line with the holes in the ground, like everyone else. Like, this isn't, this isn't rocket science, you know. Um, you know, same thing. A lot of times, it it's just involves things like showers, bath. Just mostly questions involving like they're gonna, they think they're gonna be uncomfortable because for some reason, trans people are scary, um, and half the time that you know they don't even know they're even talking to a trans person. Um, but but yeah, morale uh, morale's good. Um, well, not now, I would say. <laughs> I mean, morale but, morale is fine, right? I mean, nobody's going in there. Any dip in morale in a unit has nothing to do with the type of people that are in the unit. Every unit I have ever been a part of, if the morale is low, it has everything to do with the type and level of leadership capability within the unit that is there. It has nothing to do with whether you've got gay people there, whether you've got people of color there, whether you've got trans people in the unit. It has everything to do with leadership. The Rand, Rand actually did the same, said the same thing in 1993 before we passed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. They said, oh yeah, we can integrate gay people. There's no problem. It will take leadership. Dude, yeah, that was the, that was the Guess part. what? <laughs> Rand did a study in 2016 on trans people. Oh yeah, we can do that. It will be just fine. It will take leadership. And guess what? Leadership failed. Yeah, I would say... Um and maybe you have the same experience, um, you know, coming out to your unit as, as being trans, just, it's kind of unavoidable. Um, uh, and then, you know, you come out to medical and then your CEO, then your chief. And basically by the end of like a week, you've told a hundred people and you don't care anymore. And you're just like, I'm trans, go away. Um, <laughs> but after that hurdle, um, honestly, I thought it strengthened the unit because, uh, you see a lot of people in the military that, um, you know, are afraid to talk about any issues they're having, right? They just try to keep to themselves. And when they see somebody that's leading as an example, but also showing that they're, you know, vulnerable and working through their issues, um, it's, it's something a big help. You know, I've had uh, multiple sailors come up to me um, when I was active being like, uh, just anything really. Some people even told me they were trans and they needed help. And they're like, oh, thank God you're here. You know, just being that visible example. Um, was there but you know everybody else you know if they were having any other issues that now now it was kind of like oh hey we can talk about this like you know you're actually you know a lot of times in the military people just kind of I don't know hyper masculine or whatever you want to call it where nobody wants it everyone wants to think they're okay right and so when you're sitting there and you're saying no it's like I'm okay but I'm gonna go do this then um, a lot of times it opens the door for other people to realize that they can seek help so I would say uh, morale and unit cohesion was definitely better after I transitioned. So one other one other quick story. I did a I did an interview with a I don't know Facebook something or other. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It was it was a Facebook online show, um, but so they they needed to do a, they needed to find somebody who was willing to talk to me about uh, why they oppo why they were in agreement with the with the trans ban. And the guy that they came up with was was a former uh, Navy SEAL. And we met up in New York City. I did all the accommodating. I'm the he's he's from the area, so I'm the one that got taken up to New York City. We went on his timetable, all this other stuff. Um, and his only real argument was this idea that he was going to be uncomfortable, like he couldn't concentrate on his job if there was a trans person in his unit. And I looked at him dead in the eye, and I was like, "So you're telling me?" that you're uncomfortable with this other person in your unit, but it's somehow their fault, even though they're doing their job and they're doing just, just fine, but it's their fault that you're uncomfortable. And you're a SEAL? Yeah. Right? I'm like sitting there going, so you're telling me you can't concentrate because you're worried about the guy over there that is trans 
or the girl over there that's trans, um, even though they're probably better at their job and they're continuing to contribute to the unit and they're deploying just like you. I, I don't understand. So um, that the military puts us in a lot of uncomfortable positions. Um, if you're uncomfortable with the people that you're serving with, that's a personal problem that you need to overcome yourself, not necessarily one that says take over, take the person, that particular person out of the unit. Um, because it's, it's not that the uncomfortableness is detrimental to the unit, but not because of that person. It's because you've decided to make it detrimental. And if you can get over your uncomfortableness, like we ask you to do every time that we do something else that makes us uncomfortable, such as, you know, sleeping outdoors or, you know, being, you know, exceeding our physical abilities or a lot of the other things that we do that make us uncomfortable, including, for the most part, anybody who's ever been in the Navy and they stick you in 60-man birthing, um, you know, on 12-hour shifts and expect you to, you know, shower and figure out where all shower and eat and some people don't figure that out so you gotta you gotta help them along so <laughs> um you know there are a lot of things the military does to make us uncomfortable but any impacts to morale you need to make sure you take good stock of your own personal biases as to why that makes you uncomfortable before you say that it's that person's uh, that person's fault as to why there's a detriment to the unit there's one other topic I want to cover before we get kind of towards the final question about what we can do. Um, Sasha, I'd like uh, if you could tell us a little bit about the history of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. How was it challenged? How was it defeated? Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of um, relevance to this situation, too. I'd like to believe that you know we'll, we're moving toward um, a policy solution you know, uh, that will eliminate the ban in 2021, but if it doesn't, we're gonna have to continue litigating, obviously, but I think that with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I think that there was a lot of community um, activism that took place, you know, and that's kind of where, in doing litigation, I think it's really important, public policy too, it's really important that there's a lot of work being done in the community to raise awareness about the issues and, and, to, raise, and to elevate uh, uh, the issue in a way that you know, cracks the, the media bubble. So I think that that's part of the way in which the Don't Ask, Don't Tell victory happened was that, you know, there were, you know, there were, you know, a lot of discussion about the same kind of boogeyman that's raised with the trans ban, you know, the, you know, cohesion stuff, the, oh, you know, what the foxhole argument, you know, what's going to happen if I'm in a foxhole, you know, with somebody that's gay or trans or whatever, you know, this, these, these, you know, these constant boogeymans or what happens if women are serving in combat roles, you know, all of these fears have to get deconstructed. So I feel like that's that was a big part of that work that happened. Uh, and I think that part of it was just a change in the administration too. You know, that's what led partly to it. It was part. It was partly the education. It was partly the activism, and it was the education, and also it was the litigation. You know, all these things work together to make change, in my opinion. So I think that's what led to that. Yeah, it was definitely weird. I served at the tail end of Joan S. Don't tell. Uh, when I first started, so I was, you know, e nothing in the military, so I was in for like seven months. But it was weird because I, I knew gay people in the military, and it was just awkward at that point because you're just like, oh, we can't talk about that, okay. But you know, I've had chiefs in the military that's been in you know, since before. Don't ask, don't tell, and they were like, people knew, we didn't care, <laughs> and and now all of a sudden it was like, oh, you can't talk about it. Um, so it was it was definitely odd. So the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was actually very fortuitous for me. Um, I was in Afghanistan in 2010 when they repealed the legislation at about the same time that I found out that I was going to be a female on a submarine. And um, let's just say that the only difference between me then and me now was I had more hair. <laughs> so the whole idea of some sort of masculine female showing up onto a submarine that may or may not be okay with the fact that I'm there since we're integrating women into submarines for the first time um, was a, w would have been an issue. Um, and I know that because prior to the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, when all of our girls were getting assigned to their boats, um, one of them was investigated under Don't Ask, Don't Tell because some chief got it in him that the, his new supply officer was gay. 
and he reported it. And she went through a three. She went through a five month investigation prior to getting to the submarine because the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell didn't go into full effect until September of 2011, um, a full year later. Uh, so we were actually going through uh, sub school at the time and got to the boat three months after it. Three months after it was repealed. So um, as much as everyone, a lot of people dislike Ray Mabus for some of the social things that he did for the Navy, he is the entire reason that I'm still in it. Between the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, between that I am sitting here to give me a platform to be able to talk about repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell, putting women on submarines, uh, changing the trans ban has allowed me to showcase my abilities as each time some sort of non-readiness or non-combat uh, issue was taken off the table to allow me to uh, continue to grow as a military officer um, through numerous awards and other things that I all have to do with my performance and not me having to be trans because none of those have anything to do with whether I was a female or born a female, whether I was uh, identified as a lesbian or identified as a trans man. So none of those things had anything to do with my ability to do my job. And But Don't Ask, Don't Tell, none of it would have happened if Don't Ask, Don't Tell wasn't, wasn't repealed first. So getting back to the transgender military ban, I'm curious to hear from all of our panelists on this, but Sasha, I know you have particular expertise here. What is at stake for the larger transgender community? Sasha, I know that you're looking at the ramifications we might see in healthcare, in employment discrimination, things of that nature, but I'd like to also hear from, from Blake and Kevin. Yeah, I'll just keep it short and just say, you know, I think that if, if, if we as a society are going to start allowing people to be judged on who they are rather than the quality of their work, that's a dangerous road to go down, you know, and I think that that has implications for the employment context, you know, for our employees. At, who knows how these Title Seven cases are going to go, you know, and if, if, if some folks in some of the most vulnerable parts of our country are, are that don't have explicit non-discrimination levels on the state level like we enjoy in D.C., you know, and uh, the court rules the wrong way, you know, it's not far-fetched to imagine them arguing that by extension, look, they're denying them the ability to serve in the military, so, you know, these people clearly aren't able to serve, you know, functionally in, in, a, in an employment context either. In addition, uh, healthcare, you know, we've talked about that a lot, but that's, you know, the same kinds of arguments that have been raised, you know, by the DOD are the arguments that are raised against people that oppose, you know, tr us trying to remove healthcare barriers at, at every turn. So I feel like those are two big issues. Another one is the conversion therapy argument, you know, the, this, this idea that you have to, you know, suppress who you are in order to get by, you know, by to, to be able to enlist, you have to suppress who you are for, for three years is, is, is the kind of argument that people that are supporting conversion therapy support. So I think that you know, there's another, you know, uh, argument that'll be leveled against trans people, you know, if we move forward, you know, and that's why these cases have so much at stake. You know, if there isn't a change in, in administration in 2021, you know, we're going to continue this fight and these cases are going to continue to, to move forward and the decisions that come out of them are going to be used as precedent for other contexts like the healthcare context, the conversion context, the employment context. So there is an enormous amount at stake in my opinion, you know, um, not least of which is as well as the, you know, the the, this is a little weedy, but you know, there's the, you know, the, the courts look at you know protect constitutional protections for people, you know, based on who they are, and uh, there's a um, uh, uh, standard of review that's applied, you know, accordingly, uh, and you know, we've gotten some good decisions holding that you know there should be a heightened level of scrutiny applied to transgender people when it comes to issues you know that are constitutional violations of their protections, but if we get bad decisions moving forward, that'll be used against us in all kinds of contexts. So I just want to just underscore that I feel like there's a lot at stake beyond, beyond those issues, beyond the military issue. Um, who, who in here is uh, familiar with the American Family Association? All right, so if you go in there, I, I know you are. Um, so everyone's uh, right wing's favorite Marine veteran, Tony Perkins, uh, head of the American Family Association, and they have on their website a uh, document that talks about uh, five ways in which they will fight back against the LGBTQ community. Um, and their number one policy priority 
as listed in on their website for all to see is to regain the ban on transgender people in the military. That is their number one policy priority, which is why the Justice Department is so aggressive in keeping with this because they're in cahoots right now. Um, and part of that is because when you delegitimize your ability to serve in the military, you delegitimize your ability to be a part of a, um, what, is, what is the word, uh, civilized society. Um, because the expectation in a civilized society is that you contribute to the defense of the nation or in some sort of public office. Um, and taking that away from the transgender community delegitimizes the transgender community's ability to continue to uh, be recognized as a part of our civilized society. And it is their intention to make sure that we cannot change our documents on our passport, that we cannot change our documents on our driver's license, that we cannot have access to medical care, um, and all of these things, but they all stem from their number one policy priority, which is to regain the ban on transgender military personnel. Um, because that delegit, as much as people don't like to talk about it, especially those that are not exactly huge military supporters, they don't want trans people in the military, but they want all these other things. The only, one of the biggest ways to legitimize trans people in civilized society is to allow them to serve in the military. We saw the same thing with gay marriage. After the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, many of the arguments for gay marriage started to fall apart, and you started to see a bow wave of states and court cases coming in to change the idea behind gay marriage because, hey, all of a sudden, now we're affecting service members and their ability to be recognized by our country. And that started to change hearts and minds. Now, Part of the big thing with getting the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was that we had spent 17 years kind of changing those hearts and minds. Some people would like to tell you that we moved too fast on the trans military ban. I don't think so. I think we had, we had gotten enough press and put enough people in front of people to, to help them understand. And as you saw, we raised seven points over the course of, we went from just over 50% um, supported trans military personnel on the day that the tweets were happened to over 65%, so 15%, um, actually uh, within uh, three months of the tweets happening, uh, support for uh, overall support, not necessarily all Republican, but even they, they went up, right? And it came about as people told their stories, as people came out, as people realized that there were trans people that were being affected. And it's not just trans people, it's their families, it's their kids, it's their wives, it's their partners, it's their, um, all of those things that on top of that, and when you start bringing those families in, then you ch start, again, you start changing hearts and minds. Because it's not just, you know, random old single me with my dog, you know, living by myself, waiting for the military to, you know, fire me. You've got people with families, kids, lives, jobs that depend on that military support because that's what they've been doing for the last 15 years. We did our, we did our own internal survey that said the average transgender service member has served eight years and deployed at least twice. So these aren't people trying to join the military. That was another myth that we didn't do. Um, there are no people trying to join the military just to get their medical care covered. There's, this, this is not how this works. There are a lot easier ways to join. There are a lot easier ways to get your medical care covered, like going to work at Walgreens or um, what was the other one? Uh, oh, Starbucks. If you go and work at Starbucks, I mean, they'll cover all your medical care for transgender, for transgender care. You don't need to join the military and put your life at risk to, to cover your medical care. Um, so there's not going to be this big, huge bow wave of people trying to join the military to get their medical care covered. Um, and I've totally lost my train of thought, but that's okay. Uh, the whole idea that this particular issue, and if you watch the LGBT forum last night, every single one of the candidates mentioned the trans military ban uh, as one of their talking points. Whether or not they actually knew anything that was actually going on with it is an entirely different situation, but they did all talk about it <laughs> um, because it is huge to the transgender community. It is not just trans military. There are so many implications that come from the ability for trans people to continue to serve and continue to contribute to our civilized society that ride on that on this particular policy. Yeah, uh, I just uh, piggyback off you slightly. Uh, you know, culture, right? Um, 
when we had uh, integration of African Americans in the military. Then we had don't ask, don't tell repeal, and we were you know integrating. They were already there, but you know, uh, gay and lesbian people. Every time that happens, uh, you know, you see that increase in visibility of you know people that necessarily wouldn't talk to each other or associate with you know oh they're a gay lesbian person. I don't normally like those people. The military is a the best place ever if you want to work next to them, right? Because it'll, they'll just be like, no, you're working here now, and uh, who cares who you're working with because you you have a job to do. And I think that's one of the strongest uh, you know cultural changes that can happen with people. Um, you know, especially. Uh, you know, a lot of the military does tend to be Bible Belt people, and then hopefully they grow up and you know grow and see the change in culture. Right? They work, they work with gay people, they work with Muslims, they work with trans people, um, and hopefully it slowly uh, changes their mind. And then when those people get out, you know, they'll go back home and they, uh, you know, they'll hopefully change the people around them. And that's how you see a lot of, uh, in my opinion, at least, big culture shifts. Right. Um, that's kind of one of the main reasons why trans people need to be in the military, right? If you don't, if you don't have that, then yeah, you don't have people meeting trans people and saying, "Oh, there's no boogeyman. There's nobody, you know, crazy here." It's just, "Oh yeah, that's my coworker. Uh, we work together and we make a great team um, because we're the military and we have to." Um, so that that would be my two cents, definitely. I also uh, want to add on to one thing that uh, Blake mentioned when you're saying this isn't just about the uh, transgender service members, it's families, it's communities, and things like that. I'd also mention it's the units. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, each unit in the military has specific jobs that are assigned to every single person. You don't just get 10 people and say, well, we'll figure out what to do with them. The 15,000 transgender service members that are currently serving each have specific jobs that are critical to their units. So if things are going wrong for them, it's, it's a problem for the entire unit. Last question I want to ask before I turn things over to the audience, what can we do uh, in terms of uh, advocacy? Should I start? Sure. Sweet. All right. Um, as a veteran, um, uh, I'll, I'll take, I'll focus a little bit more on a veteran advocacy. Um, so we have a couple trans uh, or just LGBT organizations as well that you can, you know, be an active part of or ally. Um, Tava is one of them. Um, that's uh, the name eludes me. Transgender American Veterans Association. That's what I thought. All right. Um, <laughs> we have that one. We have a uh, Sparta. Um, uh, they do. We do more active duty stuff. Um, there's the uh, um, Modern Military Association, um, which is OutServe SLDN, which is a uh, organization they combined with uh, AMP, uh, the American Military Partners Association. So those two came together. So if you ever saw AMPA in the past or OutServe in the past, that's now the Modern Military Association of America. I feel, uh, not, not of America. That's actually what it is. Oh, my bad. <laughs> All right. Uh, Andy would have been here to explain that <laughs> better than me. Um, yeah, he's, he's here in spirit. Um, definitely that. Um, showing up at protests, voting, definitely voting. Um, everybody hates to say it. Money. Everyone needs money to do things. We need money to change policy. Um, whether you donate to any of those organizations um, is, is definitely a huge help. NCT, um, they're definitely another great organization. They do a lot of national level policy work. They have days where they go um, on the hill and meet with everyone. Um, so definitely another uh, organization, not necessarily veteran or military focused, but overall national trans level focused. So there were actually quite a few veterans organizations that have nothing to do with LGBT that came out in support of trans military, that came out in support of our transgender service members. Um, the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, um, Higher Grounds Advocacy, um, so there were about seven or eight others, you can Google them, um, that all came out in support of transgender military service. Um, so support those organizations because they will not only meet our needs but meet your needs as well as they continue to operate uh, as veterans. Um, and again, uh, call you congressman, your words coming from somebody who's not affiliated with the LGBT community. Uh, or LGBTQ community um, and as a veteran will resonate just probably a little bit more than than those of our commanders, right? Um, because you don't have a vested interest in my ability to serve. <laughs> so the, the saying that you would support it and move that along moves the moves the ball that much further, right? Um, 
obviously vote. I don't care if you show up to the protests. <laughs> those are those are kind of a niche thing. Um, then you, I mean, by all means, you're welcome to do so. It's just not if it's not your thing, then you don't need to. <laughs> uh, um, the other thing, uh, like I said, write write congressman vote. Get out there. Um, spread our stories. Um, I mean, there if you. Google trans military. You're gonna you're gonna come up with you know hundreds of thousands of stories that have been shared. Um, unfortunately, that probably about a third of them are mine. Uh, <laughs> hey, wait, shameless plug. If you it's, go to, it's it's not shameless. It's really no, like no, can I shameless plug? Yeah. Oh yeah, you can. Yeah, uh, if you go to SpartaPride.org, that's the Sparta website. We actually do a commitment to serve series where we interview trans service members and you'll see their story of everything uh, you know they they've done and want to share that um, has nothing to do with the main trans that's that's the whole point yeah um, it's what the, what's they're doing to contribute to to the minute to the mission um, yeah you can google me you can google uh, Jennifer peace you can you know share our stories talk about the myths talk about the things that you know we you've seen uh, discussed and tell people why they're wrong I don't I honestly, tell people why they're wrong because not everyone's opinion matters, and we need to get everyone out of that problem, that that thing. So there are things called facts, and there are things called, you know, resident experts that should be able to say what it is that is true, and people believe them. So make sure that you continue to to harp on that. So those that's my two cents. I don't really have a lot more to add. Just say thanks for um, coming here and letting us shout at you all for it. So I really appreciate it. That's really what I think is a big ask is learning to educate yourself a little bit about these issues that you might not have known before. So in um, helping to debunk some of these myths that, that are told about us would be helpful. Mm -hmm.